Hello and welcome back. We're moving into the next chapter over categorical data. This is chapter two. Uh, so stories that categorical data tells. And as you can see from the context here, we're going to be talking about the Titanic. So this is actually a pretty fun example that we get to we get to talk about for the next few days. Uh, we'll talk about, well, if we just read here, uh, we're looking at the people, who the who is the people on the Titanic. We're looking at their survival status, the age, their sex, and their uh, ticket class. So is it first class, second class, third class, or crew members? Uh, when is 19, uh, 1912 of April 14th, where the North Atlantic, and by looking at a variety of sources and internet sources, so it's kind of like we're looking at records here, like we were talking about with Tour de France yesterday, and the reason for this will be historical interest, just seeing kind of what's going on, um, and just analyzing the data and seeing the story that the data tells just for fun. Uh, we'll also go back at the end of this, uh, the end of this unit, and we'll talk about independence and the stories that the data tells and whether or not the category data is independent. So it'll be pretty interesting. We'll revisit this data uh, in the future. So first, let's do a quick review of variables. What are variables? What types of variables do we have? And make sure we know how to sort this information. So first one is an identifier variable. So uh, yesterday I told you an identifier variable just simply helps us identify uh, the case, right? But there is a, uh, and I said, a, for instance, a social security number could be used as an identifier variable or like a, um, an Amazon customer number or something like that that identifies the customer. But if we're looking at case by case where each case is in order, the same customer could be using, uh, which is going to have more than one order. So the case number would actually be the identifying variable. Uh, anything like a, um, a user number or a social security number would not necessarily be an identifier variable in that one because it's not a unique value uh, key is for each case. So uh, not like it's super important to know all the ins and outs of, all the, of, of that vocabulary where we honestly don't deal with identifier variables very much, but it's something that I throw it out there. The main two we need to know are categorical and quantitative. Remember categorical is like buckets. When we're sorting things into categories or bins or buckets, uh, then it's a categorical variable. Typically it's using words but also could be numbers. For instance, we could break down an age range from like zero to 18, that could be a bucket or a category, and then we could do uh, 19 to 35, and then th that could be another bucket, and then 36 to 45 or whatever we wanna do. We can break down age and use it as quantitative, like just the numbers, right, with the years old being the units, or we can actually group those into bins or categories. So sometimes it could be both. You just have to look at the context and, and how you want to analyze that data. All right, so uh, we want to play this game. Is it categorical or quantitative? T-shirt size. So T-shirt size, we're talking about small, medium, large, extra large, etc. Uh, is that going to be quantitative or categorical data? Are we sorting them out into bins or categories, or are we dealing with units? Well, in this case, we're sorting them out, so that would be categorical. Next one we have is hours studied. So how long you study for a test or something? Uh, that would be quantitative, and our units are, are the hours, right? Social security number, uh, that would actually be an identifier variable, but um, also could be categorical if we wanted to group this person by their social security number with all their cases together. So that could also be categorical. It's certainly not quantitative. Uh, the number of your social security number doesn't actually tell us any value and there's no reason to take like the average social security number, uh, like the average of all the social security numbers of my classmates or something, that would be useless information. The average for the height in the class or the average weight of students in my class, that would be useful information or the average number of hours studied, that would be useful, but the average uh, t-shirt size, that even makes sense. You can't average, uh, you know, quantitative or categorical data like that. And the average social security number, like average zip code would be kind of useless information. All right, next we have favorite type of pet. So it could be a cat or a dog, fish, turtle, something like that. That's obviously going to be categorical. We're breaking those down into those categories or those bins. And then after that, semester grades. So it depends on how you want to look at this. If we're doing GPA, uh, GPA could be quantitative, right? If we're going from a zero GPA all the way up to a 5.0 or something like that. Uh, semester grades also could be categorical if we're dealing with like letter grades. So like A, B, C, D, or something like that. So uh, it just depends on how we do that one, right? So if we're associating the number with it with GPA, uh, then it would be a continuous uh, quantitative. So your GPAs can range like uh, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, right? Or if we're associating a letter grade to it, like A, B, C, or D, or F, then it would be categorical. So that's one of those that actually could go either way. 
And the last one, student ID, your student ID number. It is a number, which might suggest that it should be quantitative, but your student ID number doesn't actually uh, it doesn't actually uh, behave like most numbers. It doesn't have units to it. A higher student ID number doesn't mean anything. A lower student ID number doesn't mean anything, unless it was like uh, sequential of like when you came to the district or something like that. So this is again an identifier variable. So we would consider that a type of a categorical variable. Uh, where we would group all of the same student ID numbers together because it would be the same student. All right, so let's get into data tables. So this is what our data would look like for um, for the information that we gathered on our uh, Titanic uh, passengers. So notice here, each one of these vertical columns here is going to be a variable. I should lock that in place. Give me just a second. Okay, so for instance, uh, survival, that's not morbid. Uh, so we're listing off whether or not they survived, okay? And then the next variable would be their age, so adult or child, I suppose. And then their sex listed there, so those mostly look like male, of course. Um, it's kind of odd. And then um, class, it would, would rank them their class, so first through third or crew members. Uh, and keep in mind, this data table would go on forever. I think there were over 2,000 passengers and crew members aboard the Titanic. So if we were trying to look at this, and it was 2,000, had 2,000 columns, because there were 2,000 cases or people that they gathered information on, there'd be a really big table. And we that's a terrible way to summarize that information. In fact, this entire table, uh, 2,000 uh, columns, or sorry, rows long, could be entirely summarized by a frequency table. So for instance, uh, a frequency just means like a count, for instance. So how frequent uh, or what was the counts for a first, second, third, or, or, or crew by class. So this is a frequency table by class. We could also do a contingency table, which we'll do in the next one, which will give us all of this data all put together. So if we were just looking at class and we tallied up all of the third class crew and first and second class, that would give us our contingency table, which or our frequency table, which is just the counts. Okay. So that's much easier to read than reading through 2000, uh, a list of, of 2000 uh, columns or rows. Sorry. Okay, so next we can look at the passengers by class. So that's the same thing with our frequency table over here. We have another one called a relative frequency table. Anytime you see the word relative added to a uh, descriptive, uh, to, to a word, just think percentages. So what we're looking at here is a frequency table, which is the, the counts based on their class, right? Um, and now we're looking at the percentage based percentage breakdown based on class. We also might call this the marginal distribution. So that's going to look like this over here or the relative marginal distribution. So the class and then the percentage. So it looks like 14.77% were first class and the largest group was the crew members, which was almost half of the entire ship, which is interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Uh, could we get that information from looking at this table over here, our data table with all 2000? Yeah, but that would take a long, a long time, right? So we really like to look at frequency tables and relative frequency tables helps us to, uh, to relate these numbers to each other by percentages, which makes it easier to see how it breaks down as a whole. All right, next we have ways to visualize that. So even better than the data table itself is the uh, frequency table or the relative frequency table. And now we have an even better way to summarize the information, which is with a visual graph. So here we have our frequencies uh, as our Y axis here, our response variable. And uh, our explanatory variable is gonna be our class. And then you can see, of course, the bar charts. One thing I wanna point out with the bar chart is there's space in between each one of those bars. It's not a histogram because they're not related to each other. Uh, the order in which we put these in doesn't actually matter because there's no uh, relationship or dis distribution going on here. Uh, technically, you would probably think naturally we would put them in order from first, second, third, and then crew. But why would you naturally put the crew after the third class, hmm, might I add? Why wouldn't you put the crew first before first class, right? So there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, there might be something that you would naturally want to do, but it's kind of interesting when we have bar charts, the order in which we put that information doesn't matter at all. But when these uh, are touching each other, it's called a histogram, which is something totally different. We'll get into that, I think, in a few days. Uh, but that's when the data is actually related to each other. All right, next thing again, if we have a relative bar chart, what I say relative was all about, percentages. So, so now our bar chart, instead of broken down by frequency, our response variable is going to be now summarized as a percentage. Now, if you look at these two, uh, I think this one's locked in place. Yeah. 
what do you notice about those two graphs? They're exactly the same. The only difference is our scale that we're looking at on the left. One of them is in percentages, uh, which would be a relative bar chart. The other one is just a, a regular bar chart. So it's the same information. One of them is broken down if you wanted to know what the counts were, so it would be easy to read the actual counts. The other one is reading the percentages. Now, even though it is nice to have the relative bar chart, think about it. What information did we lose when we converted from a bar chart to a relative bar chart? So we have the overall, but what we lost was the specific actual counts. So we don't know unless we knew the total number of people that were on board the Titanic, then we could find 40% of the 2000 people and which would give us our rough estimate of about 950 uh, crew members or whatever the actual value is. But even better than the bar chart might actually be to have the actual specific data, which would tell us it was actually 885 crew members. So there are kind of pros and, and cons and uh, between all these, uh, ideally, if we're looking at just big summaries, then a graph is easier to read than the actual specific data that we would get in the table. And better than all that, uh, the worst would be, of course, the data table, which no one ain't nobody got time for that. We got we got homework today. All right. Um, okay, so next thing we got is pie charts and bar charts, comparing these two. So you're already familiar with pie charts. We actually don't use them all too much in statistics, uh, but they're still important. And then over here we have our bar charts. So what I'm showing here is the pros and cons of the two and when we would use one or the other, which is kind of interesting. You might not have actually thought about the difference, but this is uh, pie charts are used when we're comparing parts to the entire whole. So the whole thing is 100%, which is the whole pie. And then this will tell you what percent of the pie visually is the crew. So you can see it's a little bit less than half, right? Then about a third of them are uh, third class, about a quarter, or sorry, about an eighth of them are first and about an eighth of them are second class as well. If I looked over here and I asked the question like, which class was the smallest? Is first class the smallest or second class the smallest? It might be kind of difficult to see between those two, which one was the smallest. But if we look over here in the bar chart, which one is the smallest class size? Clearly the second, right? That's a lot easier to compare those two to each other. So when we're comparing parts to other parts, we're going to use uh, a bar chart whenever we want to compare it to the whole, the overall, uh, the 100% makeup, then we use a pie chart. Also, one point out, pie charts, visually we are easy. It gives us uh, quick estimates for a half, a third, a fourth, uh, an eighth or sixth or what, sixteenth or whatever. So clearly you can see this is half. This would be a fourth, that would be an eighth, and these two would be sixteenths, right? Also, visually you can probably see this one here is close to a third, right? Meaning this one's also about a third and so is that one, right? Uh, so pie charts do have their, their benefits, especially when we're comparing to the whole and looking for independence. So we'll see that word later on. But uh, bar charts are better when we're comparing and wanting to know the actual uh, the actual relationships between each one of them, like which one's the smallest, which one's the biggest, and by how much uh, between those two. So we get more precise values from bar charts. We get better quick estimates from pie charts. So kind of cool. I like that one. Next thing that I really need to uh, to uh, drive home is the area principle. So anytime you want to use some odd uh, odd display instead of just a, a standard bar chart or pie chart, we need to make sure that we are not violating the area principle. So the area principle says that the area uh, of each color or, or, or variable that we're displaying must be proportional to its actual value. So if we look at the graph of the United States, this is proportional to the area of the state but not necessarily the electoral uh, college votes per state, right? So for instance, up here, uh, Montana, uh, there are not a lot of people that, that live in Montana. I know someone from Montana, but I know two people. Okay, I know two people who are from Montana. Uh, so Montana has very few electoral uh, college votes. They only have three, where California has 55, and Texas uh, has uh, apparently 38, Florida 29, and New York also 29. So. Uh, this is not a very good demonstration of the overall breakdowns of the electoral college votes, right? So if you looked at this, and typically this was, I think, from um, this is the last election, so four years ago, uh, you would think um, that the the red candidate would win, right? Because it's a greater area, but those are more rural areas. Uh, in, in the Midwest. And so there's actually more population density on the East Coast and the West Coast. Of course, that's not news to you. So if we resize this to not violate the area principle, uh, kind of bloating the states so that the 
area or the size of the state was proportional with its population, which is also uh, proportional to the electoral college votes, which is kind of interesting, then this is what America would look like. Isn't that beautiful? I guess beauty is in the eyes of Beholder because it looks bloated to me, but um, kind of fits with the whole America thing, right? So uh, look at how small these states are up here. Montana has shrunk it down. Uh, Texas, everything's uh, bigger in Texas, I guess they say. And of course, California, uh, Florida, and New York are other big states. I didn't realize uh, New Jersey has such a large population. Anyway, so uh, kind of cool, but uh, the main thing we're looking at here is, of course, the area principle. So th this type of graph is not shown very much. Let me show you uh, some other violations of the area principle. So here we're looking at the crew third, so class uh, breakdown for for um, for the Titanic, which is this information over here. And yes, this one's prettier to look at than the bar chart, but and it is technically the exact same information as you can see that. But the problem is, is that whenever we increase the size of this image here, we're not only increasing the length of the image, we're also increasing the height of the image. So we're actually squaring the values between the difference, uh, the, the, the difference between the values. So if we go from, let's say, second class to crew members, let's say that's three times as big. It's not just three times as long, it's also three times as tall, meaning the total area of what we're seeing visually here is going to be nine times the area of the second class. So it favors the larger portions and also kind of skews and favors the smaller ones and really shrinks them down as well. So instead of seeing the difference between second class and crew as being about three times the, the length like we would read here, now it's going to be about nine times the overall area because our eyes are not trained to only pick out the length of the boats, but our eyes also pick out the total uh, area which is also including the height of those as well so you got to be really careful not to violate that area principle all right hopefully now you can see why that is so when it comes to three-dimensional graphs just don't do it uh, they shouldn't even offer them um, in in uh, microsoft excel or the office suite or anything like that or on powerpoint they shouldn't even offer them because they're they're not they're not any good it of course violates the area principle so hopefully you can see that let me give you another example i think we actually even saw this one on the the title screen from yesterday, they gave us a pie chart that was broke down in 3D. Uh, yes, this looks much more visually appealing than this one over here, but it's not correct because you have this entire front surface that's being added on to the pink and the green, which is the first and second class, that you cannot necessarily see, especially on the crew here, because it's covered up. So visually, your eyes are going to misjudge this. Also, anything that's in the front is going to be larger than anything that's in the back because of one-point perspective. Uh, so the things that are in the back are actually shrinking the area as, as far as the size of the area of the plane that's in the front, just because that's how our eyes uh, see things. So we actually would see the proportions and the breakdowns better using a, a, a two-dimensional uh, pie chart instead of the three-dimensional. So do not use three-dimensional uh, graphs because they violate the area principle. So just cross those things out. And well, that just wasn't uh, distorted <laughs> right there but technically it looks good. I'm not gonna cross out America because that just feels wrong. All right, next thing we have is a contingency table. So instead of only breaking one down uh, by its by class, for instance, we can, which would be one variable, we can break it down across two variables, like for instance, class and survival. And this is where the information uh, that it tells gets really juicy. So here we have our first variable, which is class, first, second, third, and crew, which is the exact same information you see here, right? That should look familiar. Uh, so that's the total number that we had there. And then we're going to break that down contingent on the survival. So did they survive? Yes or no. Uh, so that's where we get all eight of these because we have the four and the two here. So we get eight all together. And that is going to be our contingency table. So these are, are, are really important and probably the most common ones that we're going to deal with, at least with categorical data. So that's our contingency table. The other thing I need to point out to you would be the uh, the actual marginal distributions here. So if you think about on a piece of paper, the margins are the parts that are on the outside or the edges of the paper. So the marginal distribution in a contingency table is gonna be the part that's gonna be on the outside or the edge. In this case, it's gonna be the totals. So here you have your overall total of people who survived and not looking at their class. 
So we're taking this two variable breakdown, the contingency breakdown, and we're collapsing it down to only looking at one variable, which is called the marginal distribution. So instead of looking at first, second, third, and crew, how the survival distributed across the class, we're only looking at the total survival. So total that survived were 711, total that died were 1,490 out of the total uh, people who were on the Titanic, which was 2,201. The other one we could do would be a marginal distribution where we are collapsing the survival. We're only looking at class, one variable now the, with the marginal distribution. So the total class uh, counts or frequency for the class for first class, second, third, and crew. Okay, So those are called marginal distributions. Uh, sometimes you're only going to be given the contingency table without the marginal distributions and you have to add them up. Uh, but uh, often they'll, they'll actually they'll, they'll give you the marginal distributions. Okay. So here we got this one. That's the exact same thing. So forget that. Looks like I, oh, I forgot to cut it out. So if I ask the question, who had the highest survival rate? So when we're looking at the word rate, uh, that's referring to a percentage. So which one had the highest percent of survival? How would we figure that out? So we're going to look at the distribution for each class. Let me see if I can go back here and unlock this. Uh, -doke. Eh, okay, whatever. All right, so what we want to look at is for first class, what percent survived? So what was their survival rate? So the total that survived were 203 out of the total, which is going to be 325. So that would give us some percentage, okay? Then for second class, their survival rate would be 118 out of 285. Same thing for third class, 178 divided by that number and that number divided by that number. Which one do you think had the highest survival rate? Uh, just looking at these values, it's going to be somewhere between first and second. I'm not sure. We could actually break it, break them down, uh, and we will uh, later, or, or right here, right now. So there are three different ways that we can write percentages. So we can do either a percentage of the row, a percentage of the column, or a percentage out of the entire total, even though that one's not used very often because it's not very helpful. So here we have three percentages broken down. We still have the same information that you had on the last one uh, going across so the 203, 118, 1, 178, etc. Okay, then we have the percentage of the row, of the column, and of the table. So of the row is going to be the distribution of survival across the classes. So it looks like uh, of, and see where the 100% is, that'll help you read it as well. So of the 100% of all the people that died, or of that, all the people that survived, 28.6% were first class, 166 were second. So this is the distribution of survival. Next one is the percent of the column, which is going to be going up and down. So that's where the 100% is here, percent of the column. So of all the people that were in first class, it looks like 62.5% survived, 37.5% uh, died out of the 100% of all the people that were in the class. Okay. Then the last one is going to be the percent of the overall table which is going to be the 203 out of all the people. So of all the two, 2,201 um, members of the Titanic, what percent of those were uh, first class survivors, which would be uh, only 9.2%. What percent of those were crew members that died? 30.6%, and that's how we read that one. That last one, the percent of the table, that one's rarely ever given, because again, it's not that helpful uh, to see the overall distribution, but the, um, the the conditional distribution of survival and the conditional distribution of class those two are much more helpful so if we wanted to know what was the survival rate so what percent survived out of the total so of all the survivors uh, what percent yeah should be here so first class out of all the people that survived I think it's actually no, it's out of each column. So first class, what percent of first class survived out of 100% here? So it looks like our highest survival rate was 62.5 first class. Second highest was the second class, as you probably would expect. Then the, then the third class and then the crew. The overall survival rate for the Titanic was the 711 out of the 2,201, which would be the 32.3%, which is the overall survival rate. All right, so that's it. You're, that was 25 minutes, so 
kind of hit about what we were what we were wanting to do. You just got three problems on the back side of the homework there. On the front side, you can read through um, those uh, notes. I, there are page numbers there. I know you guys don't have textbooks yet. We're still working on that. Um, so th that should be pretty easy for you to shade it in. Some of you guys were converting the uh, converting the PDF to a Google Doc. Um, when you did that, you lost some of the formatting and the pictures, and it kind of uh, made it a little bit weird. See if you can try to keep it as a PDF uh, and just simply edit the PDF if you can. There should be a way to mark it up so that you can write on it with your, your finger or a stylus uh, on the iPad, or if you're on a computer, you can actually insert text there. Um, if you're yeah, you'll have to type it up if you're on a computer. You're going to want to do some shading here uh, for these tables here. So you might try to use your iPad for that. Um, in general, I think the iPad might be the easiest way to do it. But you guys have free reign to try to figure out how to do it um, however you want. So anyway, if you have any questions, you can ask the questions on Google Classroom. Or if it's an emergency or if you just want to get my attention about some tech issues or something like that that you're having, you can always reach me uh, through Remind. It'll go directly to my phone, so I'm more likely to get back to you uh, sooner for that. So I'll see you guys tomorrow, and I hope you have a good day.